welcome and good evening. I'm glad to have you join us for this Men and Nerds hosted interview with Drew Hart, the author of the new book, Trouble I've Seen, Changing the Way the Church Views Racism. Uh, my name is Caitlin Hansen. I'm a writer for the blog By Their Strange Fruit, uh, which is a blog on race and Christianity, and I'm the Minister of Music at Church for All People in Columbus, Ohio. I'm here with Drew Hart, uh, the author of this great new book. Uh, Drew is a PhD candidate in theology and ethics at Lutheran Theological Seminary. He's a writer for Christian Century through his blog titled Taking Je Jesus Seriously, and he's a fellow Mennonerds blogger. You can follow him on Twitter at Hart, H A R T. Um, and we're going to have a great conversation this evening about his book. Glad to have you, Drew. Oh, thank you, Caitlin. I'm really just pleased to be here, and I'm glad to have this conversation with you. Excellent. Well, to begin, I was hoping you would uh, share with our audience just some of your background to get us started, and then also some of the impetus for this book. Yeah, um, my background, again, as you said, I'm a PhD candidate in theology and ethics. Um, trying to wrap up, getting that done, and I'm also, for the last past 10 years, I've been an um, uh, associate pastor at two different churches. One was a multiracial church in Harrisburg, in the inner city of Harrisburg, in my community, um, and another one is a black church um, right on the edge of Philadelphia. And so um, that that ministry kind of perspective and pastoral ministry perspective um, certainly was a big part in, in shaping my the book, the focus of the book, and the intent of the book. Um, uh, otherwise, I'm a husband and a father and a friend. I uh, live in Philadelphia. Um, I'm a PA boy. All my education has been in Pennsylvania. Um, and so I guess... Um, I wrote the book, I mean, it was, I mean, I call the book Trouble I've Seen based off of the, you know, the old spiritual, nobody knows the trouble I've seen, but it was uh, my time to just share my story, you know, a little memoir, but also not just to tell my story, uh, but it was intentionally um, crafted to kind of uh, make an accessible case for the church to really reflect and think about how it thinks about race and racism um, my experience has been that in the church too often we have a very thin understanding of race and racism and I wanted to expand it and offer us a much thicker one and especially a theological one, one that is faithful for followers of Christ. So that's why I wrote the book, especially in, and specifically, I mean, maybe it's almost obvious, so I almost didn't even say it, but it, in light of all, everything that's going on right now, it just seems like it was the appropriate time. Yeah. So at the very beginning of your book, you take some time to say some of those names of the black men and women that have been killed recently at the hands of police and vigilante justice um, over the past couple of decades. Uh, you take several pages to do that. Why was that important? Yeah, I mean, it, it was very intentional, um, and I, I wanted to kind of put us in our moment, in our historical moments, and in the conversation that's taking place right now. Um, I think it's easy in the church to have these kind of abstract conversations about race and racism while we're kind of floating above it all. Um, but I think that we have to take seriously the actual consequences of what's happening in actual people's lives. Um, you know, we're talking about creative, beautiful, complex people um, whose lives have been taken away. And so we need to really account for that when we're having these conversations. And we need to remember, like, actual people and actual names, um, not just statistics, but these, the fact that they're named. I mean, somebody named them. They're somebody's kid. You know, they're part of somebody's family. They're part of communities. Um, and they have been ripped away from that. And so we need to be able to humanize them and remember them and say their names um, and remember that they're people created in the image of God um, and really account for this very ugly history that has taken um, black lives um, over and over and over again for centuries. And we have to account for that. Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm reminded in, in scripture over and over, we see the importance of names and remembering history and saying those names and in yeah. um, the intentionality with which skip scripture says names um, and and when shifts in names happen, how important that is. And yeah. with this idea that we need to say their names uh, regularly um, yeah. with intentionality. Yeah, no, it's it's very important. I absolutely agree. Yeah. Um, as you mentioned in the book, you draw upon a lot of your own experiences and are are generous in in sharing with your reader um, some of those experiences to bring the church out of the abstract and into this thicker understanding that you talk about. Um, you open talking about an experience with your brother. Um, or an experience that your brother had and um, how that affected you. Could you tell our audience here some of that? Yeah, I mean, it was it was an interesting time in my life because I was, and I kind of joke in the book that I was kind of like frolicking around the country, but it's true. Like, I was at, uh, at this Christian college, mostly white Christian college, and for whatever reason I agreed to take this cross-country trip because we had a guy who lived on a floor who lived in Washington State. I, you know, I think he's still the only person I know from that state. Um, and so a few of us decided we were going to take this cross-country trip, and we did all the way across. And so we're kind of, I mean, it's almost like the um, stereotypical college life. You just feel free, right? And you're just above it all, and you're having deep conversations and the ride across the country. And so we're doing all of that. And when I get there, um, I get a phone call, and I find out that my brother had been arrested. Um, and and the more I found out, um, it, the more troubling it became because uh, I found out that he was arrested merely for the description of being a black man with a black t-shirt and blue jeans. Only description. He wasn't even at the scene of the crime. He was hanging out like blocks away, um, and he was actually picked up for that. Um, and eventually, I mean, he spent about almost four months locked up pre-trial. Um, before they realized, obviously, that it wasn't him and started, you know, the case fell apart and, um, and he was, you know, released. But but it it reminded me, it, it was the first time, I mean, I knew that this stuff happened. I mean, uh, that wasn't, that something like this happens wasn't new to me. That's new to some people, it's not new to me. Um, but it was still not real. It was out there, it was other people's families, you know. This was my brother who, he's a year older than me. He's about my same size, my complexion. People used to get us mixed up. Um, some people asked us if we were twins, you know, growing up. Um, we were very close. We shared rooms. And so when that happened, um, I internalized that. It, it made me realize how vulnerable I was. And it, it, it just changed my framework for thinking about some of this. Um, from, yeah, I think it's very easy to see it's other people's problems until it hits home in your own family and you realize um, just this massive racialized system that is harming and killing black people constantly. Um, in conversations with your brother, are you willing to speak to what effects that had in him to be locked up for quite some time uh, with this? Yeah, you know, he does not talk a lot in depth about it, um, and I won't, I'm not going to give his business. There's a couple things that I think that he'd seen and stuff while he was there, but I'm not going to get into his business, um, so I, I let him tell that part of his story. But, um, yeah, but he hasn't, he's he's talked more surfacey about it for the most part, but I know, I'm, I'm certain that that has impacted him, yeah. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned that you went on this cross-country road trip um, while you're in college at a pre predominantly white uh, Christian college, and you talk about your experiences in the book in three very different educational settings. Um, be before I ask uh, my actual question, can you just describe those three settings for our audience? Yeah, so I grew up in Norristown, Pennsylvania. It's um, an urban, technically it's not officially a city, and I think in some parts of the country it would be called a city of its own, but because it's right beside Philadelphia, it's called a borough. But it's about 30,000 people. Um, it's about a third black, a third Hispanic, a third white. Um, and so that, um, you know, it was a 
very um, racially diverse place to be, but at the same time was kind of segregated in terms of um, communities. But everybody would interact, especially if you go through the school system, everyone interacted um, on some level. And so, um, so mostly poor working class in the borough, on the edges of it, was a little bit more suburban. Um, so that was where I grew up for the first 15 years of my life. And then next was um, North Penn, which was the Philly suburbs, and um, more middle class, majority white, um, middle and upper class, actually. You did have pockets of different racial groups um, there as well, but, uh, but definitely overwhelmingly a white community. Uh, much more fluent than what I had grown up in. And then finally, um, the last place was in central Pennsylvania, small Christian college, um, liberal arts college, um, mostly evangelical Christians in terms of the student body, more majority leaning conservative, um, and it was kind of an isolated um, campus away from even, some people might call it suburb, I would call it rural. Um, but I guess it's depending on where you're coming from. But it was disconnected. You didn't have access for transportation to get anywhere if you didn't have a car. Um, yeah. So you went to two predominantly white schools, yeah. uh, one for high school, one for college. And one of those was a Christian setting, and then the, before that was a secular setting. Yeah. Um, can you describe some of the differences you observed in uh, sort of the, the racial dynamics on each of those campuses? Yeah, so I mean, and really uh, everything that I, in terms of my experience at the other places, it's all in relationship to my initial experience in Norristown, which I often say I felt very normal um, there. Um, I didn't feel like I stood out. I wasn't, I was neither a cool kid nor the, you know, Kid on the margins, I just kind of just existed in the mix of things, you know. Um, and then in North Penn, I was terrified going there. I, I assumed that before I got there that everyone was going to pick on the black kid and stuff like that. Um, but that's not what happened when I got there. I would, you know, show up and I was instantly popular, right? And people thought it was cool because they knew Norristown. They thought that was cool that I was from Norristown. Um, and so I would go to the, you know, play basketball and getting picked first before people had even seen me play, you know. And so I was trying to figure out, like, what was going on. I wasn't being ostracized. I wasn't being bullied or picked on for being black. Um, but there was uh, racial stereotypes that were heavy and, and it was drenched, but it was coolness, right? So even though I was the same person, same character, same personality, I... Um, those things, you know, as I moved into this different space, there was a racial gaze on me that interpreted me, interpreted that same person, the same Drew, in a very different way. And then likewise, when I went to um, the Christian college, I also saw a shift. It wasn't, again, I, so I went in thinking, this is going to be great. These are my brothers and sisters in Christ. I already know how to, you know, navigate a white majority space and so these are my brothers and sisters this will be 10 times easier so I get there um, and not only do I go through culture shock but then um, I eventually begin to see just all the kind of anti-racist kind of stereotypes and biases that people carried and particularly um, noticing that people were intimidated by my presence um, were a little scared of me before they got to know me um, I started hearing how white students were calling other black students thugs behind their back and things like that. Um, and just so I was beginning to realize um, the kind of way that uh, people were gazing at me and at others, and even though I was the same person, same character, same body, same everything, personality, all that, um, there was this gaze of a thug and danger um, that shaped me, and it wasn't until people like, got to know me and learned, oh, you're a Bible major, right? And then all of a sudden, you know, people let their guards on. But you're constantly, over and over again, going through those motions of um, trying to allow people to see your humanity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, what about what was it about the Christian school that made it such a different experience, more likely for students? to label you or others as a thug or to rely on stereotypes. Sounds like it was more so even than the predominantly white 
a secular school. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that was what was most troubling for me, especially as a, I was leaving um, my college, finishing up my undergrad, and just thinking about my experience. I was really struggling with how it was more difficult for me to be in a white Christian space than a non-white public school, I mean, a white public school. Um, and I had to really, you know, wrap my mind around why that was the case. Um, you know, I, I had to wrestle with history, I mean, to start with, in terms of the church and the white church's role in racism in this country and the ways that, you know, racism has has deep Christian theological inter, intertwining going on um, for a long time. And, and what a lot of research has shown is that white Christians – tend to have the strongest um, oppositional perspective on race than even white non-Christians do as it relates to conversations around race with black people. So a white Christian is more likely to be have a polarized position on racism um, than a white person that's not Christian. And so there's a smaller gap, um, and a greater gap, I should say, the other way, a greater gap for black Christians and white Christians um, when it comes to race and racism. But I think, I mean, at the heart of it, I mean, I think white churches often are extremely homogenous spaces, and they're spaces in which people are being socialized into these homogenous networks and theological conversations that deny racism and deny black experience and the experience of other people of color. Um, and so they're being socialized to see the world in a particular way while also being isolated um, even more so than often a lot of other people are. And so it wasn't that people were mean. It wasn't that, you know, at the Christian campus people are not friendly. If anything, I actually thought, I do, and I still I, I think that this was one of the friendliest places I've ever been. People were waving and smiling at everybody, throwing frisbee. I mean, just, you know, but yet um, they've been socialized to think and live in a way that perpetuated racism and were not examining their own biases and how they were um, raised. And so I think that's a big part of it. But it's, that, in some ways, that's the question I've always wrestled with, right? You, a lot of what I do is wrestling with um, how this could be in the Church of Jesus Christ. Yeah. I'm wondering, I'm trying to think of sort of equivalent institutions in the secular world um, that would function like churches in their ability to segregate populations like that. Right. Maybe the, and, and the maybe educational students. institutions in some ways have traditionally. Um, I mean, that's starting to break down more and more. But I'm. But there is a way in which I think educational <laughs> institutions have always had a kind of racial hierarchy and a way of weeding out people of color <laughs> and 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 posing a certain way of thinking and a certain way of doing things um, that had to conform to white dominant culture as well. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I'm reminded education is always touted as the great equalizer, the thing that's going to, um, you know, help folks come out of, uh, you know, harder living situations into the middle class. And I think the reality is um, often it, it Acts to uh, to to reinvest those structures um, and to formalize uh, the, those divisions in a way that we still convince ourselves um, it actually combats when right. it's really reinforcing those things. Theologically, uh, you talked about kind of the, some of the history of the church in, in the United States and how some of that historical understanding of, of Christian theology has interplayed with racism in the history of the United States to put us in the situation we're in right now. Can you speak more to that? Yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, so I, I, I'm very influenced by Anabaptism and black theology, and one of the things I think um, that the two traditions both wrestle with is what it mean to take Jesus seriously, right? Um, and I think in terms of in our everyday lives, I think that one of the things that have happened in the West is that there's a claiming of Jesus without necessarily following Jesus and taking him very seriously in our own lives. 
and I think that has created space for, so like, you know, you can actually, you know, hold, not, ins you can ro colonize countries, conquest, kill, steal, rob, pillage, everything, you know, and call yourself a Christian, and those two things, there's no hypocrisy, there's no sense that that's a problem, even in saying that. And I think, so how we even define what it means to be Christian, um, I think has been domesticated over time in such a way that it's just a spiritual reality and has very little to do with how we engage one another in our society. Um, and that seems to be the exact opposite orientation of Jesus Christ that we see in the four Gospels. And so um, I think theologically, um, the, the dilutions, the domestications, the distortions that had to take place for people to conceive of themselves as Christian and, their, and even be conceive of themselves as Christian nations, right? It's an innocent, good, you know, the hand of God in the world. That's how people have imagined themselves. And at the same time, um, have the history of colonization and slavery and, and genocide um, all um, interworking and intertwined in all of that. And often theology, which we don't really take seriously, was either being silenced at best, but at worst, it was undergirding it and justifying it all along the way. Um, and so those are some of the things that I think that we all have to acknowledge and wrestle with. And then, and that means we have to put everything up for question, right? Everything needs to be back on the table for wrestling with, is this a faithful way of understanding our thing? And, and not everything that we've inherited, just because my mama did it and my grandpa did it, um, doesn't mean that it's faithful. Um, and so maybe we have to question some of the ways that we articulate and live out our faith. Absolutely. Um, you talk about in your book um, this idea that in churches it says it's common for white people, especially white evangelicals, to talk about being colorblind, um, but there's no hesitation to speak about black problems. You go on, race isn't actually avoided, but discussion about racism is. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, I think th that's that's at the heart of, I think, the 21st century mode of racism. Now, sometimes I've been backing off this a little bit because I think Trump is, like, making my argument harder to make because I feel like he is, like, the epitome of the old school racism coming back a little bit. But, uh, but in general, um, I think that the way that racism uh, works today is very different than it would have in 1950s in terms of the discourse, in terms of what people say and think. And so right now, most people insist that they're colorblind. They insist that they just see people as people. Um, I've heard people say, well, can't we just all be Americans, right, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and at the same time, they're engaging in all kind of racialized practices. Their lives are extremely, you know, shaped and defined by white community, white thought, white, you know, if you go and look at their bookshelves, it's all white authors, their church is all white people, the only speakers they invite in are all white people. And so, like, their lives are, like, extremely racial, um, and yet they're not necessarily acknowledging that. And at the same time that they're saying, let's be colorblind, then it's free game also then to, you know, attack and pick on black people and poor black people especially right are always it's free game to um to assault their character and their personhood and to you know um you know oh they're freeloaders and you know welfare queens and all these kind of comments that are made um and so we love you know picking on poor black people um who are vulnerable in our society um and then at the same time you know if we even dare to mention our history to to talk about statistics or anything like that that would point out that we have a white dominated and controlled society, then all of a sudden we need to be colorblind and not talk about race anymore. Um, so it's very hypocritical, it's back and forth. It's So people will talk about race when it's convenient, that black people, this black, this black person said this, and we want to talk about reverse racism, uh, but we don't want to uh, acknowledge the racial systems and structures. Uh, we don't want to look at statistics. We don't want to look at the overwhelming way that a society is shaped and organized and how it impacts uh, black people and people of color in our society. And so I think, um, yeah, it's hypocritical. I, 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 I'm just so used to hearing it all the time now. Um, and I, I'm always interested that sometimes people will literally, in the same statement, they will start talking about being colorblind. By the end of the statement, they're talking about black people. <laughs> I'm like, how does this work? Um, so, yeah. yeah. 
if you can help me out on how that works, I don't know, but it, but it's a phenomenon that I see all the time. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, this ideal of colorblindness in our society um, that Christians, particularly white Christians, by and large, have bought into. Do you think God's colorblind? Is God colorblind? Um, I think God God is not blind to anything that's going on in our society. Um, God has his eyes wide open, um, and I think God. Well, number one, God is is the one who created humanity in all its diverse beauty. Um, but much more than that, I mean, I think the real issue is is that when we're talking about colorblindness, the issue because of this hypocrisy has never really been about not seeing color. Um, what is actually going on is it's a it's a verbal strategy that wants to not talk and discuss and see racism, right? Um, they don't want to see, it's a denial of, uh, of observing and paying attention to the oppression that's going on around us. It's a ignoring of the domination. And I think God, if we look at scripture, um, absolutely sees domination and the power dynamics and oppression. Um, and scripture is um, saturated all the way from the beginning to the ends. Um, with addressing that and God making judgment statements and standing with those who are most vulnerable um, um, and whether it's a matter of ethnicity or just poverty or whatever, whatever social condition of vulnerability we're talking about, it's clear that God has taken sides and stands with those who are um, vulnerable in that way. And so God sees, God knows, and God is present in the midst of it. Do you think God has a bias for the oppressed? Yes. <laughs> um, yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, that, that is, for me, you, I don't know how we can read the biblical narrative um, and come out with any other conclusion. You know, I had a, a student last night, um, I started um, teaching an African-American theology course, um, mostly white students, undergrad. And, um, and so I was talking and, you know, I make sure I keep giving space for students to talk and share. And, and so one student said, like I agree with everything you're saying. God really cares for the poor, but I think at the heart of the gospel, it's a universal call because died, God died for all of us. So I was, I'm like, yeah, of course God died for all of us, but um, but that like one doesn't cancel out the other, and in fact, many of these things are intertwined. And what does that mean for us to accept Jesus when we look at like the life of the rich young ruler in Zacchaeus? Um, it's a repentance and a turning away from a particular kind of life that continues to oppress other people. You know, the rich young ruler was unwilling to do that, and so he walked away from Jesus. Zacchaeus, you know, is much more than, you know, our, our Sunday school songs. It's a story about um, reparations, right? That's the big, that's the, the highlight of the story at the end is Zacchaeus is going to give back, you know, everything that he stole twice and give half of what he owns to the, to the poor. Um, this is a radical story of Jesus' encounter with him means he's going to engage in radical redistribution of his wealth that he knew he gained through oppression and, and exploitation. So, um, so I think the question is, um, it's on one hand, yes, God stands completely biased in terms of those who are oppressed and most vulnerable. God repeatedly stands with, with the orphan and the widow. And at the same time, God is for all of us but what that requires for us to, to be intimately um, abiding in the life of Christ in that kind of way, in the truest sense of the word, demands that we repent from our way of life and enter a way of life that's faithful to the crucified Christ. And that is the challenge that some of us have find troubling. But uh, when we go after it and when we pursue him in that way, we find out that it was a much more valuable way of life than we could have imagined. Amen. Uh, so uh, I'm wondering if your student was saying uh, all Bible characters matter. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. All Bible characters matter. That's right. Um, I just think it's, you know, I, I think actually what it was, I mean, it's just in many ways, I, I'm, I'm not surprised by the question that he answered, um, that he asked, because the, we're socialized. I mean, in America, there, we have a long history of putting, you know, spirituality up against the social reality and social implications of the gospel. And so it's like one or the other, right? And so we feel like if 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 the significance of Jesus' death and, and resurrection um, is real to me, then I can't also then um, think about the social implications of Jesus' life. It's like one or the other, but, you know, there's no bifurcation 
in the gospel in that way. Just there's no need to kind of rank them. It's all one and the same. It's all a part of God's kingdom and coming around and being presence around you know the living Jesus um, today. And so we don't have to choose between um, the spiritual implications and the social implications of Jesus' life. We can just take them as one unified new reality that we're invited into. Absolutely. So you told the story of Zacchaeus. What are the implications or what's the model for the American church and, and our understanding of our history and where we are today? Yeah, I mean, I, I often tell people, people ask me repeatedly, so what do you think about reparations? I'm like, Jubilee, hello. Um, it's not really a question that much. I mean, it's only a question if we refuse to, to seek honestly um, what Scripture has to say. Um, because, I mean, it seems pretty clear for Jesus. You know, his famous, um, in Luke 4, 18 and 19, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me release to the captives, recover the sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free. And then he says, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, which is a euphemism for Jubilee. Um, so even Jesus... Um, is proclaiming Jubilee, um, the giving back of lands, the uh, freeing people from slavery. Uh, I mean, it's just this fresh start, um, and it's a radical redistribution. I mean, I know that's scary for for the American church. Um, we don't like those words at all, but that is what Jesus taught. That's what the Old Testament taught, um, and, and that is what is rooted in, I mean, if the kingdom of God is about the new social order, uh, ranged around Jesus' lordship um, um, and living according to that. Um, and Jesus, in his encounters with folks like Zacchaeus, he, they have this intimate experience, and that's what he's compelled to do afterwards. Um, then we've got to wrestle with what does it mean in a country where we have stolen lands and labor, and I'm talking about the white church particularly, stolen lands and labor, what does it mean to you know um, live out Jubilee in this context faithfully? And I don't have any like simplistic, easy, like, oh, just write checks for everybody. But I do think these are actual questions that every church that has benefited from these um, systems of oppression and domination have to at least be asking and wrestling with and seeking how they are going to, at least as a community at the least, um, practice um, um, jubilee, practice uh, kingdom living. Because I think without that... Um, we're just playing around. If we're not willing to accept the cost um, of setting things right, right, participating in what God is doing of setting things right, then um, we're just playing games. I don't know. So I, I think that for me is is a great model. Um, it's a Jesus shaped model, but but it's often much more radical than the American Christianity that most of us have internalized. Um. So, in continuing, you, uh, earlier in our conversation, uh, kind of made a, made a passing reference uh, to old school racism, and you talk about that a little bit in your book. Can you talk about the, what you term old school racism versus new school racism? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I use that language because I try to help us think through the reality that, like, racism isn't a static thing. Um, that it, it's something that has always been mutating, shifting, and changing. Um, and so the ways that we define what racism is um, often are based on, like, these, like, documentaries from 1950, right? And so we see, you know, the KKK out there, and, and we see um, people using different water fountains, you know, and, and we hear about cross burnings and things like that. Um, and people being called the N-word and calling, you know, black grown men boy and stuff like that. And so we're like, yeah, that's racism, right? So we've kind of defined it based off of something that has occurred 50 years ago. Um, and what I often say is, you know, because racism is always changing, um, what was going on 50 years ago is not necessarily relevant for what's going on today. So if someone in 1950 were to define racism based on something from 1850, they probably, by that standard, wouldn't look very racist themselves either, right? Because they're like, hey, we don't hold slaves, you know, that would be horrible, the black clothes, all this. I mean, so, I mean, it's it's not very helpful for us to judge our own lives based off of a standard from decades ago. And it's more helpful to figure out what is going on in our society today 
Um, what are the ways that we talk racially and think racially in a way that oppresses and con continues to like operate out of a racial hierarchy framework? Um, and so today, it is things like um, you know colorblind ideology um, and different code words that we use, um, and it is you know mass incarceration, right? So maybe so if during from 1619 to 1865 is you know a slave institution, and from 1865 up to like the mid 20th century, we have um, we have you know. Uh, mass lynching, 5,000 lynchings, and we have, you know, conflict leasing systems and, you know, white ter white supremacist terrorism going on. Well, the question is, what's happening today? Um, right now, today, we see, again, mass incarceration. Uh, we see um, un underfunded um, public education. We see inadequate housing. We see um, disproportionate... Um, even just in terms of income and wealth, all kinds, I mean, food deserts, uh, you could go on and on and on in almost every category, healthcare, um, no matter what the category is, you're going to see disparities um, that are being caused because of racialized systems and policies uh, and ideologies that back those policies and practices. And so, um, so I guess, yeah, I, I think that we have to pay much more attention to our own generation and to redefining how we're living out or participating in racist systems uh, rather than defining it based on what was going on 50 years ago. Um, we will all look great if we, you know, put ourselves up against a different generation rather than against our own generation. Yeah, so going back to something you talked about in your book, you say um, when polled in 1946, nearly 7 out of 10 white Americans surveyed believed that, quote, Negroes in the United States are being treated fairly. So this, you know, yeah. in the height of Jim Crow, all sorts of things that we now look back on um, and and at least liked standing up saying that it was wrong or, you know, uh, or, you know, 20 years later been marching alongside. Um, and you go on to note that um, given that uh, 7 out of 10 white Americans could think that black people were being tra treated fairly at such a time of unrest and suffering calls into question the capacity to which any dominant culture group can discern an oppressive moment with even a little ob objectivity. I yeah. Think that your point is, as far as using uh, uh, history to... Uh, sort of judge ourselves today. After all, I think somewhere else you say we're all a product of our time. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, I, and I think that's huge. I mean, so, and, and my climax to that point is like, so it's, it's no one, it's not controversial at all. Um, no one will disagree that for the first 350 years, right, from 1619 uh, up through the mid 20th century, we can all agree that most white Americans were getting it wrong. Most white Christians, just fails as it came as it comes to race and racism. They just frequently in each generation, in different manifestations of racism, they all failed in their own generation. Um, and likewise, we can look back and we can see black people in each different stage, um, um, also speaking out of their own experience. And we can all agree now, right, that the majority of black people knew their own experience that slavery was wrong, that white supremacist Jim Crow system and terrorism was wrong. Um, and that today, black people continue to say there's something terribly wrong going on. And so my, my climax of that point was that, you know, what's the odds that if white people, we all agree, got it wrong for 350 years, and black people were getting it right for 350 years, what's the odds now that uh, white people suddenly, randomly, inexplicably got their act together and now are, have the advantage in understanding race and racism and oppression and black people who've been right for 350 years, we all agree, and now suddenly they simultaneously, while white people all got their act together, black people just lost the capacity to know what they were experiencing in their own bodies. I, obviously, it doesn't make that much sense when we think of it that way, but when we don't think about it historically, we lose track of the fact that dominant societies tend to be socialized in such a way as to not see their own faults and not to see their own um, oppressive acts that they're engaging in. And so we have to really take seriously um, how 
being a part of these systems teaches us to not own up to them and to ignore our own complicity in them. Yeah. I want to uh, read a question that we've gotten from the audience to you. Um, so this this person notes, how do we begin to unlearn these Western slash American mindsets that makes us blind to seeing the radical realities of Jesus' life? How do we begin to unlearn these mindsets? Wow. I mean, I think that's the, the task is, one, I mean, I, where, where are we going, I think, is the center of it. Um, so, I mean, a lot of what I'm trying to urge people to do is to turn in the opposite direction. In America, we want to focus on who's the most powerful, who's the wealthiest, um, you know, who's the most popular, whose voice um, has the most influence, right? We love in Christian communities, people with big platforms um, um, who are selling all the big books. And so we focus on particular people, usually it's white men, um, as the center of everything. It's not that there can't be other voices, but everyone's kind of sprinkled around, you know, white men. Um, and at the same time, we often ignore the folks who are in the margins, the folks who are in the cracks of society. Um, those perspectives are not shaping the life of the church. Um, and I guess, so, if we're going to unlearn, we have to take a different posture in terms of learning and who we're going to learn from and who we're going to give our air to and where we're going to spend our time. Um, just like I said earlier about, you know, bookshelves, I often bring that up because it's usually easy because usually if I ask somebody, you know, who's on your bookshelf, I mean, it's very few people um, who don't, most people have almost, almost exclusively all white people on their bookshelf, you know. They're lucky, lucky if they have 10% people of color and women um, on their bookshelf. And so, um, so who are we going to? And that, where, in terms of reading, in terms of our churches, in terms of where we're spending our time, where, what communities we're part of, um, even just where we place our bodies. You know, who, where do we think we belong, and where do we feel like we do not belong? Um, and, and what communities do we find that we belong in that we're learning from and growing from and being changed by? Um, I, I often tell, you know, I'm influenced by thinking about, you know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's transition, particularly because he has this really meaningful experience in Harlem, um, and that certainly opens his eyes and begins to change how he sees what's going on back in his own country. Um, so I think we have to have these experiences and these relationships, um, and not just with your black friends, right, but with a community. Um, and learning the range of voices and perspectives and the wisdom that arises out of that community um, and allow that to shape you. And I think that's the very thing that is hard is that, you know, often a lot of white people do not feel like they have anything to learn. They feel like they have everything to give in these kind of encounters across racial divides. And so it's hard to, for them to, in humility, step and realize, I need these other folks in my lives to be more whole and to find shalom and well-being um, as God desires. And so um, so the challenge is, is first to own up to our limitedness, right, our humanity, our broken humanity, but then also to um, be intentional about the communities that we're a part of and people that we do life together with and the people that are influencing us, because that is what socializes us, right? Um, and so if we could, you know, spend time more with the people that Jesus did, right, those who are most vulnerable, I think we would have a different vantage point, and it would shape how we read scripture, it would shape how we gather, do church together, it would shape how we engage in society and the things that we speak up on against, and so um, everything would flow from, from those experiences of meeting Jesus on the margins. You mentioned Bonhoeffer's experience. Can you tell some of his story um, perhaps as an example for white Christians as they're delving into these topics. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, at the short of it, I mean, so he's this, you know, he's a German theologian. He, when he begins writing, if you if you ever read any of his early writings, which most people don't, um, he very nationalist minded. I mean, in some ways, he could have very well been just another. Uh, white German theologian supporting the Nazi when it, when it came to rise, if you've read some of his earlier stuff. Um, 
But he eventually, uh, after getting his doctorate and just wanting more education and experience, he goes to New York. This is in like 1930. Um, and he's there for a year as a student. And he meets up with a guy named Frank Fisher, who's a Negro from Alabama originally, who's one of the few black students there at uh, Union Theological Seminary. And they connect, and he begins to go to church with uh, Frank Fisher at uh, Abyssinian Baptist Church, and which is in Harlem. It's like this, it's a famous big black church, kind of the classic, like, prophetic black church, justice-oriented, you know, um, when you think of that, you should think of like Abyssinian Baptist. So that's where he's at, and he's teaching Sunday school there, and he's getting involved. He's beginning to like love the spirituals, and he's like buying the spirituals, and he's having these experiences of like not getting being denied service with his friend at a restaurant, and he's concerned about the Scottsboro trials, and he's writing about them back to Europe, trying to get people to speak into this racial injustice that was happening there. Um, he's going down to Howard College because he wants to meet these Negro intellectuals. And, I mean, he's reading Harlem Renaissance. He's got positions on the W.E.B. Du Bois versus Booker T. Washington debate. You know, he's, he's getting involved in being shaped by this experience, um, probably diving in much more than he'd ever expected. And in that process, um, when he goes back to Germany and in 1933 Hitler comes to rise, he's speaking up and he's writing about the church and the Jewish question, right? Um, which most theologians who are part of the Confessing Church, um, like Karl Barth, they were they were writing about the church and how the government shouldn't interfere in it, with it, but they didn't care about the relationship of the Jews, right, and what was going on to them. And for Bonhoeffer, that became a primary theological issue: um, is what's going to happen to the Jews, and and should the church intervene? And he even got to the point of saying that if necessary, the, you know, the church would have to be a spoke in the wheel, right, and disrupt the system. And so, um, and he would eventually, being a part of an underground movement um, of resistance, was arrested and then eventually um, was executed in the concentration camps. Um, but I think what we see is, and he says it in one of his writings before he's arrested, right before he's arrested, he talks about seeing things from below, um, and seeing that from that vantage point along, seeing from the vantage point of the oppressed and those who suffer, that that was a better vantage point to explore the world. And so um, I think that really is the challenge, is that in entering into and joining in in solidarity with folks on the margins and those who are suffering under domination, um, a person can actually see from a different perspective, right? Sometimes people say, oh, I'll never know. You can know a different, you won't know what it means to be in somebody else's body, but you certainly can be shaped by and influenced by the perspectives of others um, on the margins and see from a different vantage point than you used to. And so I think that's an invitation to follow Jesus into society um, and to see life from the vantage point of the crucified Christ. So I think in large extent ties into to what you've just said, but can you talk about how uh, Anabaptism and Anabaptist theology inform your understanding of of race in a Christian context. Yeah, I mean, so I would say, I, I probably would say that I don't think Anabaptism informs my understanding of race in a Christian context that much, but it does help me think about how to respond to the racial realities um, now that they exist. And so, what I mean by that is. Um, it forces me to ask the question of what does it mean to follow Jesus faithfully in this time and, and to wrestle with the fact that if Jesus was revolutionary, what does that mean um, for this time? Uh, some would say a nonviolent revolutionist, right? I guess if you want to be Anabaptist, that would make, make them more comfortable. But, um, but, uh, but certainly um, Jesus um, was fully engaged in his society and was engaging um, those and confronting the establishment in Jerusalem and such. Um, for me, uh, what I do then, because Anabaptism doesn't actually help me think about race itself, um, it's black theology that helps me think about race and racism. Um, and so I go to black theology to, you know, name the lie of white supremacy um, and to speak truth about, you know, the relationship of God and the oppressed. Um, but then it's in white supremacy, it's in um, Anabaptism that helps me think about what that might look like to do that faithfully. 
Um, and so those two things kind of have come together for me. But to be fair, like white Anabaptists are just as implicated, I think, in um, these patterns of silence and, and denial um, as many other Christians are. Um, I know like Mennonites, for example, they will pride themselves that in general Mennonites didn't practice slavery, right? And I don't dismiss that as nothing. I, uh, thank you for not, um, you know, enslaving my people, right? Um, but that in and of itself, um, you don't get cookies for, for, for not enslaving people, you know? Um, what, what would have been better is if they had been radical abolitionists, um, which was rarely the case. Uh, very few did. Most of them kind of stayed to themselves and ignored what was going on and worried about their own affairs. Um, and so, and even through the 20th century, you know, Mennonites sometimes will say, well, you know, Mennonites aren't supposed to get involved in government. But they were getting involved when it came to military conscription. You know, they're finding loopholes and, and, and um, trying to get the government to create other options for them. So they, they when they wanted to, could have. Um, so I think that um, Anabaptists have a lot of work to do still, in white Anabaptists, I should say, have a lot of work to do. But that said, there are some amazing um, black Anabaptists and Anabaptists of color that have said a lot, um, though they are usually left on the fringe of Anabaptist conversations. But um, Vincent Harding was a Mennonite for a while before he left because he was frustrated. Huber Brown similar wrote a book called Black and Mennonite and was challenging Anabaptists to engage black theology as well. Um, but he left frustrated as well. Um, there's other folks like Regina Shantz Dulcifus who's been doing great work um, for decades in the Mennonite church in terms of anti-racism work. Um, white Mennonites like Tobin Miller Scherer who's also been doing work like that. There's folks who are there but oftentimes um, these voices are not the ones that are being centralized. It's usually white men again um, whose theology and theological practices are shaping the conversation and it's usually to the detriment of racial justice. I often say, like, as brilliant and as witty as a guy like Stanley Hauerwas is, um, he's going to recreate the problem of not owning up to the societal patterns and problems that are going on beyond the church because he's so ecclesially focused that he doesn't understand how to contextualize the church for society. So I think um, Anabaptist theology needs to really wrestle and have been much uh, become learners and dialogue partners with black theology and I think in some ways it would make them more Anabaptist in the 16th century sense than um, than what many Anabaptists are today. You note that white men are often positioned as the neutral kind of objective arbiters of theology. You call them the theological referees right. uh, for everyone else. Um, in context, or in, in contrast, I wonder um, how non-white male theologians actually might be better at positioned to interpret scripture at times. Yeah, I mean, and I think, and I've kind of said this a little bit, but I mean, I think some of it is just wrestling with, I mean, first and foremost is, you know, what was the social disposition of Jesus Christ himself? Um, and whose lives are closer to that reality, right? Um, not to say that none of us are Jesus Christ, but whose lives, I mean, he was a poor Jew living under Roman occupation, right? Uh, who was, he, he knew what it was like to have his cousin grabbed by the authorities and executed, right? Given a state-sanctioned execution. And then he himself also went through that same thing, right? Or through an unfair trial, was given a, a state-sanctioned execution. Um, whose lives understand that kind of vulnerability in society under dominating forces, and how does that shape our reading of scripture, right? Um, because I think, again, it's what are we, sometimes we're being socialized in a way to ignore certain things that are just clear in the text, um, and we kind of downplay them if you're a part of a system that um, benefits from not talking about these things. So I think that when we think about, you know, um, those who are vulnerable and marginalized, we're talking about poor folks, we're talking about, I mean, for Jesus, it's the poor, it's vulnerable women, it's those who are outcasts, it's the sick, um, it's the Samaritans, right? Um, those are the folks who, um, who 
it seems like the gap from their life to Jesus' life in terms of joining in with what God is doing is very small. It's a very easy shift for them. Um, I think it becomes harder when we're talking about interpreting Scripture. If the majority of Scripture is written mostly from the vantage point of folks who are, you know, on the underside of society, you know, whether it be empire, you know, Egypt, um, Babylon, you know, <laughs> Persia, all these empires, Rome. I mean, you have empire after empire, and the majority, not all of it, but the majority of it is written from the perspective of the underside. Um, how then, you know, like we have to be able to account for that in our reading and to ignore all of that, that the scriptures are saturated with these things, to ignore these realities, um, I think is a reflection of people's own social biases. So that they think that even though it's saturated all throughout the story, those things actually don't matter at all. Um, so I think sometimes it's people who, they can own their particularity, right? I, I, I said in my class, you know, like um, yesterday, for my African-American theology class, this mostly white student, I'm like, I own that I, I speak as a young black male. I do. Like, I don't, I don't try to pretend like I rise above it, that I'm, you know, universally objective and I just see all. I speak from my vantage point and I can own that. Um, but I also engage and speak and engage others and read scripture, knowing that that's my reality and wanting to see beyond that as well, um, which means I need other people to hear their voices and their perspectives. Um, I've talked in the book about, you know, um, Rita Finger. She was a, one of my Bible professors, um, and people warned me about taking her class because she's a feminist. That's what I was told, and be careful. Um, and what I found out was that she was just teaching people to take seriously Jesus' relationship with women, right? That he privileged women that were vulnerable and that he was... Um, challenging um, the patriarchal system at that time. And so I needed women to, uh, I needed this woman, this scholar, um, to kind of open my eyes to that. And in the same way, I think that um, white men especially, um, and folks who are at the center of the system, who benefit, it from, benefit, it, benefit from it most, often need the eyes and perspectives of others to see the things that they're not seeing and the ways that they've been socialized to read scripture in a way that it, ignores the almost obvious, you know, perspectives um, that would kind of challenge, I think, you know, ways that participate in domination and oppression and violence. Um, so <clears throat> go back to your initial question, like, there is no neutral position, right? There is no, um, that's an imaginary position that, you know, I'm just doing theology and everyone's doing black theology and women's theology and this and that. Um, we are all just human beings, finite. Um, God is the only universal one um, and the only objective one. And so all of us are relying on the rest of the church to, to open our eyes and for God to speak and to inform us and to challenge and stretch us beyond our limitedness. And so I think that's a challenge for us to get to that point where we can own up to that and see that there are particular groups and communities that do have a, van a better vantage point for reading scripture than we do at times. You're also careful in your book to note um, other, other people groups in the United States that have experienced depression different than yours, than, than your people group, and to um, kind of wrestle with the stories of, um, of Latino folks living in this country, of Native American, American Indian folks living in this country, as well as women. What, just that, speak to the importance of that exercise for you and that sort of intersectionality. Yeah, I mean, I guess what I wanted to do, I mean, so I'm, I was sharing my, a lot of it is my experience. Um, so as a young black male, I'm writing from my experience um, and what I've seen. Um, and I'm trying to, and I was trying to set it up within the framework of thinking about like, what is white supremacy? I know people are scared by those words, but I'm trying to help people think about what that actually means. Um, and so a lot of the book then is frames thinking about whiteness and blackness. Um, but I didn't want us to just get stuck only thinking about white people and black people as we talk about this uh, racial hierarchy and how that shapes our lives. And so um, what, what it, it was really important for me to make sure that I gave time to think about 
how we are all navigating and living in this racialized society, um, how we are all in different ways um, impacted and influenced by it. And so, I mean, I, I started the chapter off talking about Native American experience, which sometimes, at least certainly on the East Coast, I mean, because we don't have a lot of Native American presence, um, it's a very smaller population, certainly in Philadelphia, um, we certainly don't. Um, it's very easy for them to continue to be marginalized and made invisible in these conversations. Meanwhile, this is their lands that we are all on, right? Um, and we, so we have to be able to talk about the stolen lands and the genocide and um, the colonization that took place here um, um, toward from white people, particularly towards Native Americans, but then expand that out to talk about all the different people groups and the different ways that they're racialized, and it's in unique ways, right? So each community has a different story, and we have to be able to um, hear um, the different challenges and obstacles that they're going through that are not the same. Um, too often we compare um, one group and put them against each other rather than seeing that everyone is navigating a racialized society um, and we all need healing from all of this. Um, and at the end of the day, it's all about kind of the loading over others kind of tendency that kind of humanity is, you know, um, always drawn towards. Um, and that includes patriarchy as well, right? Um, how women often are seen as inferior. So it's still a kind of social hierarchy in which uh, people are seen as less than. And so how do all these things come together? Um, I think it's something for us to all to be thinking about. And for me, as a Christian, you know, Jesus gave us some language when he talked about, you know, the Gentiles lord over you, right? And then he says, but not so among you, right? So in the church, that option is kind of cut off. And so we have to kind of realize that we need in the church, we all should have an anti-loading over others ethic, right? Um, that we, That's something across the board, no matter what we're talking about, whether it's race, whether we're talking about class, we're talking about gender, um, whatever it is, that we need to be able to have this approach of um, refusing to lord over others um, and to see our humanity and to reorganize our lives around Jesus in such a way that affirms the humanity of everybody. Um, and so that's the task and the challenge. And so that's, um, it was important, I think, for me to push so that it doesn't just become a black-white conversation. I think in America it's complex because I think black Americans are highly visible, the way blackness has operated, right? It makes so when we talk about race, it's usually black and white conversations, um, but there's so much more going on, and so we need to be able to have a more nuanced conversation. Um, and in some ways, you could say, even as I spent you know, a whole entire chapter doing that, I, in some ways you could say it, it could have used more, right? Um, and I think that's just the beginning to open up for people to explore and have deeper conversations around those topics. Uh, so in thinking about American culture and sort of the dominance of Christian culture in the United States, to what extent do you feel like it's even possible for the Christian church in the U.S. to identify with Jesus and the early church um, in the current cultural realities in the United States, and what can we do about it? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, in some ways, Jesus kind of answered this question for us, thankfully, right? I mean, he, he said, like, he's like, it's going to be, it's, it's, it's really difficult for the rich to enter into the kingdom of God, right? I mean, that's what he said, right? It's going to be really hard for the rich to enter into this new social order, um, the God, God's kingdom. Um, and I think that can be extended out towards, you know, everyone that participates in dominant culture um, and benefits certain controls and lords over others in any kind of capacity, right? Um, and so, and I would say, so... It's for so if I was say talking about white people, I would say like it varied. Like so, a a poor white app, someone uh, poor and white from the Appalachian Mountains, probably it's not very difficult. <laughs> it's not that difficult maybe for them to identify with Jesus in this kind of way, um, given our realities. Um, but I think it is very difficult for folks if they. The, the reality, you have to, something about the way that you live your life has to be able to change. It can't remain the same, right? That's the task of repentance and following Jesus. It demands that something has to change. And I think for most of us, you know, most people don't want to change anything, 
they're very comfortable and they don't want to change anything about how they live and how they organize their lives and who they associate with and who they identify in the world. If you won't change anything about that, then you can't change and shift how you identify with Jesus. And so usually we we move Jesus to look more like us and, and fit into our world rather than shifting and changing and reorienting our own lives. Um, but I think for the communities that have been historically... Um, yeah, so if you've been historically advantaged by systems of oppression, it is difficult. Um, and so, you know, we want to claim Jesus' name. We want to claim... Um, salvation, we want to claim baptism, but few want to follow Jesus, right? Few want to actually identify and take um, his life seriously, um, and particularly in relationship to, you know, the, those who are the social outcasts and Samaritans of our day. Um, I mean, I, at the end of that passage where God talks about it being difficult, he also says all things are possible, right, through God. Um, so, I mean, it's not a hopeless situation, I think. Uh, with God, all things are really, truly possible, and so we can uh, believe that that something other than what is is can can actually happen. Um, but it doesn't mean it's likely, right? Uh, and I think those are one of the the hard things that I think um, largely the church in America, but especially white Christians, are usually not willing to accept what the implications of that means for their own lives in terms of any kind of radical repentance and trying to live differently and, uh, and engage to resist oppression and violence um, and systems that are, you know, crushing other people's lives. So, yeah. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, how white folks enter into these conversations and I guess the idea of white fragility um, yeah. and why you think white people are fragile you know, or act fragile in conversations about race um, and how can our understanding of scripture help them better enter into these conversations? Yeah, I mean, so, and I, I do share an interesting story in the book. It kind of just, while I was writing, it just kind of came to my mind um, was this experience where I was, it was at a, a justice leaders conference. It was like 300 leaders there and were there. And um, and there was a particular woman, a white woman, who was a part of a racial conversation that she wasn't invited into, but she went anyway. It was like supposed to be invitation only. Um, so clearly she's the fact that she's there already means that she cares about justice, and she particularly wanted to enter into this conversation on race. Um, and I'm, so I'm, I'm assuming that um, her heart was definitely in the right place, that she wanted to, you know, be a part of that and be a part of the solution. Um, but we were having a very frank, open, and honest conversation in that space. And so afterwards, she came up to me, and she was... Um, struggling with some of the things that she heard and she was struggling with like somebody asked you know can you be christian and white right and like well so she's like getting very emotional and i was like well you got to understand like when they're saying white you have to understand that they're talking about whiteness as a social construct right so they're not talking about can you be a person of european descent and be christian and that's not the question the question is the social construct of whiteness in the sense of having being superior to others and participating in social dominance. Can you do that and be Christian at the same time? So as I was explaining that to her, she just starts crying. Like a tear is like coming down her face. And I'm like, oh boy. But I was just kind of, I was in that, I was like, no, I'm not going to let you off the hook with this one. So I just kind of pushed further, right? And I was like, look, you're getting very emotional right now. Um, and I think you need to like think about like why is it that you're being emotional because your identity seems to be very tied up in your whiteness so that the very even even though I'm explaining what they meant by that it was still so troubling that you're crying now you know and so I wanted her to like kind of be self-examine why she was wrestling with that and then I told her after that like you know this we were having a very high level conversation um, and it was invitation only and you kind of just assumed that you could go anyway. And the fact of the matter is, like, you are you don't even understand some of these basic things that we're talking about yet. You have a lot of work to do yourself um, to get there. And she actually was she was like, yes, she agreed. She had, which is what I mean when I say like, I think she had a good heart in the beginning. I think there was just stuff that she just didn't even realize 
that she didn't know and she didn't realize how intertwined her own identity was in whiteness. And so, um, so yeah, I've seen people respond by crying. I've seen people get angry. I've seen people, um, you know, spout out irrational responses or socialized responses. I hear people say the same stuff all the time as well, you know. Um, but I think in one way or the other, I mean, they are socialized reflexes um, that, you know, it, some of these ways of responding is because people are uncomfortable with not operating out of something other than the framework that they've been given, which is that whiteness is just the greatest thing in the world and blackness is bad, right? And so if we don't work within that framework of scapegoating black people and saying wonderful things about how good and generous and ben benevolent white people are, then people start getting uncomfortable when you challenge that framework um, and they start, uh, there's a lot of backlash going on. Um, and so I think um, the challenge is, you know, is for us to enter into these conversations with humility um, and with a sense of us um, not, that we're not God in this conversation. None of us are God. Like, we don't have to have it all together. We don't have to be perfect. We're not the saviors to everything. Um, but we can just come as human beings in the need of, in need of God's grace um, and enter in. Um, and stumble along the way. I mean, I think it's one of the interesting things is watching the disciples, um, especially in the Gospel of Mark, I mean, they're just terrible. <laughs> you know, they just, they've just got no clue. And sometimes we got to understand, like, that's us sometimes, you know. I mean, I think if we can see ourselves not as the perfect ones in the situation, but as the disciples who just don't have a clue sometimes, who are just missing it, and we can just own that, um, I think there's a lot of hope Um that we're, we can change our posture from always being the teachers. You know, I think that's the thing for white people. Can you switch from being the teacher to the learner, right? Um, can you learn from the people that you've said um, are less than? Um, I think that's the, the challenge. Um, and I think that a lot of folks would, will, um, would be, I think that posture would change everything in our conversations. Um, and it's, so, I mean, it really is about becoming disciples um, in the truest sense. And sometimes being a disciple isn't only about following Jesus, but like as Paul says, right, he says in First Corinthians, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Sometimes it's imitating other people who are imitating Christ as well. Um, and so learning how to follow Jesus um, in the ways that other people are following Jesus, particularly in ways that are difficult for us in our own communities, I think is important. So I think for white people... That would mean learning to follow Jesus as, you know, black folks do, right, and as uh, Native Americans do and stuff. I think that there's something liberating and freeing and transforming about um, entering to those worlds and understanding Jesus from their vantage points um, that I think it's a much greater gift than people realize. I think they see it as like a negative, and what they'll realize in the end is that it, they've been given a great gift. That's fantastic. Uh, so as Christians, I mean, you've talked about often our, our stated goal on earth is to become more Christ-like, to follow after Christ, to, um, to become more like Christ. How do we conceptualize that, particularly how do white people conceptualize that without ultimately supporting an ideal of saviorism? Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, this is, that that is the challenge, um, I think, in, so, so Part of my answer would be kind of going back to what I just said in terms of the kind of mindset of being disciples, right? Um, that we need to imagine ourselves as following Jesus. Hopefully, sometimes we're not even there. <laughs> if we're lucky, then we're actually stumbling along trying to follow Jesus um, and getting it wrong a lot along the way. Um, and I think when we accept that role, right, as, as the goofs of the story um, who just don't get it half the time, then I think it's from that posture that we might just maybe sometimes um, make visible the story of Jesus in our lives, right? <laughs> um, um, but it's precisely when we assume that we're the saviors of the world that we've, uh, we've already failed in it, right? We've already lost it. Um, um, but even most, I mean, so I think particularly one passage I go to a lot um, is Philippians 2. Um, I think it's just really interesting, verses 1 through 11, um, 5 through 11, it talks about, you know, Jesus emptying himself. He doesn't um, 
take advantage of his equality with God, but he empties himself. And he not only takes on human form, but it says that he takes on um, the form of doulos, the slave, right? He takes on the slave condition, the most vulnerable of society, right? That's how Jesus identifies. That's how Paul is identifying Jesus as the most vulnerable in society. And, um, and then ultimately um, to um, ending up um, being crucified, right? So that's the path that Paul takes us through in that journey. But in the beginning, right before that, um, there Paul is talking about how having that kind of mindset like Christ is going to shape how you know, we do life together. Um, and so it's this posture of humility, um, and it's a posture of other-oriented, putting other people before ourselves. And so, I mean, in some ways, it that is cutting, it goes directly against this kind of savior complex, right? Um, that, that in entering into a kind of mind of Christ, participating in the very mind of Christ, the logics of Christ, um, will actually put us against kind of seeing ourselves as the saviors to the world and so great and wonderful and everybody should just be so happy. It's like when people, you know, after 9-11, people are like, well, why do people hate us so much, right? Because the, the only reason you can ask that question is if you think you're just so amazing that it's hard to fathom why someone could have problems. And especially given America's history and the West's history um, around the world, it shouldn't be that hard to think of. But if you think of yourself as just so great and you're just... We're just giving democracy and freedom and capitalism to the world. We're just wonderful people. Yeah, then it, it's really hard to imagine why people might, you know, hate you. But if you can be honest about, you know, enter into humility and see things from a different perspective and enter into trying to see things from the perspective of the other, right, um, that, that gives us a different vantage point for exploring life. Um, and I think that it does. It cuts off the mentality of being saviors to everybody else and I think the white, white savior complex is something that still has not been dealt with very well in the church. Um, I, I do tell a story in the book about um, being in Harrisburg and seeing you know white people um, so this is in a poor black and brown community I lived in, in Allison Hill in Harrisburg and um, in this one particular part of town like you just don't see white people at all right I mean just in general you just, just white people just aren't there you might see like one or two um, well this particular day I'm driving through and there's like this mass of white people there and I'm thinking like what is going on and um, and as I get closer um, you know I see that they're handing out groceries to everybody so they're doing a little service work and they're adults, not kids or teens. And I get closer, and then I see that they've got these yellow, bright yellow T-shirts on. I'm thinking, okay, that's interesting. They want to be seen, and they're doing a good job. And then I get even closer, and then I see what's on their shirt, and it says Harrisburg Invasion. And I'm just like, all of a sudden, at first I'm like thinking it's funny, and then now I'm like fuming, right? So I'm like just pissed. I'm mad. Um, that how dare they come into our community and they're going to invade our community. They're clearly not from our community, and they're going to invade. And they actually put it on a shirt. They didn't just have the mentality. They actually thought it was okay to put it on their shirt, too, and advertise it. Um, so we were just helpless, poor, black and brown people just in need of white saviors to come and invade and do a one-day drive-by ministry and move on, right, and ne never to be seen again. And so... Um, and so, I mean, for me, that encounter and that moment, that experience of seeing that happen... Um, helps me think about this kind of white savior complex that they, they, in their minds they're doing good, they're being benevolent, they're helping people, but in some ways the racial hierarchy had never been broken. Um, they still saw themselves as superior and have everything to give and nothing to learn and to receive from others. Um, and so um, there's so many other ways that that, that could have played out. Um, had they had more humility, um, there could have been a great partnership with leaders, black leaders, brown leaders in the city that had been working for generations in that community who would have had much more wisdom about how to, you know, engage a community in, so, in, a, in more meaningful ways probably um, and use those resources probably in better ways as well than randomly giving out to everybody on the street. So anyway, I just think, like, those are some of the challenges that we have and I think that if we don't take seriously um, the way that Christ actually leads us towards non-saviorism, right? Um, in some ways, he's, a, he's the non-savior, savior, right? Um, in terms of what he models for us. 
Um, and if we can't figure out what that means yet, and maybe let me just add one more radical thing just to stir it up a little bit, right? Think about Jesus' encounter with the Syrophoenician woman, right? So you have this encounter where this woman on the margins corrects Jesus. He, and he accepts it, right? He's, he accepts the challenge and, and, re, and changes his own framework based off of what he, he was just challenged by her. And so I'm thinking, like, if, if Jesus models that for us, and I know some Christian communities that create theological problems, right? So how you can, we can do all the kind of loops we have to to explain it. But at the end of the day, this woman corrects Jesus, and he accepts it, right? That's the, that's the punchline of that story. And so he models for us um, a different way of engaging people on the margins. Um, and it can never be as always having everything together, um, but that sometimes Jesus even models for us how to be in need um, from other folks in society as well, and how we can be gifted from them and expands what we know and what we see in the world as well from them as well. So I think it's, it's beautiful. So I want to close out by reading a, again from your book and then maybe off, offer you an opportunity to kind of give final thoughts around that. You, you say that, that Christian piety and oppression could so easily coexist should be horrifying. And it reminds me of a quote from Spencer Perkins, uh, who observes that blacks have not been able to distinguish between white Christians and white non-Christians when it comes to racial issues, and, and that that has ultimately hurt uh, Christianity's witness, uh, uh, both locally and around the world. So just with those in mind, invite any final thoughts you might want to share. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, it gets back to, um, I love, one of the things that were very influential for me in my undergrad was reading um, Frederick Douglass's um, slave narrative, and particularly it was his appendix, because it was just so powerful, um, the way he just made, you know, he's like, there's Christianity and there's the religion of this land, right? <laughs> Um, and there's nothing, it could not be any further apart, right? That's pretty much it. And he goes on talking about, you know, the, the religion of this land was a slave-holding, woman-whooping, cradle-robbing religion, you know. Um, but he, and he hates that, he says. He uses the word hate, but he says he loves, you know, the peaceable Christ. Um, and, so, um, and so he puts this strong contrast. Um, and I think, thankfully, there's a large tradition in the black experience of, of, of denying that as a faithful expression of Christianity. The sad part is that many people have also been turned away from Christianity um, because of white Christians, or white professed Christians at least, um, how they have behaved and engaged in society um, or now have denied our past and then perpetuate present realities. Um, I think for a lot of people that's deeply troubling. And so um, we scandalize the name, we vandalize the name of Jesus, I think, when we do that. And so we have to take seriously our, our witness in the world. Um, and so um, if there was a time for change, a time needed for change, um, you could say has always been right now in America for the church. Um, and so I'm hoping that um, folks will join me and even you, because you do great work in terms of um, really taking seriously these issues and um, changing how we think about race and then changing how we live and respond to the world in light of that new framework. Well, great, Drew. I really appreciate you having this conversation with us tonight. I'll remind everyone he is the author of the wonderful new book, uh, Trouble I've Seen, Changing the Way the Church Views Racism. It's from Herald Press. You should check it out. Um, and, and I'd like to maybe just uh, close us out in a word of prayer and particularly pray a blessing over you in your final uh, bit of studies as you wrap up your PhD work. So if we'll pray, Holy Abba, I thank you for this time together uh, with True Heart as we wrestle with your word for us uh, as, as Christians that live in a racialized world, a world that prioritizes uh, one race over others, and, and the problems that that creates for us in the body of Christ as we seek to see your image in all people and to work against the oppressive forces that 
uh, rule our world. Lord, I ask that you uh, guide us into that posture of learning and humility that will guide us into a better understanding of who you are and our role um, in, in your great plan on this earth. Lord, I thank you for Drew and the work that he is doing, and I ask that you uh, bless him as he goes about the, the final steps in, in his studies, um, as he gets oh so close to defending his dissertation. Uh, we just pray that you walk with him in that to, to its final completion. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Drew.